All right, I want to go over the type of errors we can have when we do hypothesis testing. So we're dealing with type 1 errors and type 2 errors. Now, type 1 errors, it's easier to think about it first in the court of law, because the court of law also has type 1 and type 2 errors. Type 1 error is when you incorrectly reject the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis being someone's innocent, they become guilty. Type 2 would be the opposite. That would be that you retain the null hypothesis um, when in fact you should reject it. So that would be letting someone guilty go free. Um, people always ask which is worse. Well some of it is going to be your opinion, but most of the time people worry more about type 1. And the chance of a type 1, the probability of that happening, of making that mistake, is alpha. So some famous cases of type 1 errors would be the Salem Witch Trials, Ed Johnson, um, who was sentenced to death for the rape of a white woman. He was a black man in Tennessee in 1906 when he was innocent. One of the most famous cases is the Scottsboro Boys case, um, 1931 in Alabama, where eight of these nine boys were sentenced to death, again, for the rape of two white women when they were, in fact, innocent. So the probability of a type 1 error is alpha. So we actually decide. We can decide how much risk we want to take of making this mistake. Now some people say, well, why not just make alpha crazy small because then it will never, ever happen. And that does seem like something you could do. The only problem is the smaller alpha gets, the less chance you have of incorrectly um, rejecting the null hypothesis, but the bigger chance you have of doing what's called a type 2 error, all right? So that means that there's a chance that you could then, you know, say the proof for guilt is so, so high that you basically just let every single person walk away, and so no one is ever proven guilty, and everyone is always innocent, even those who actually are guilty. All right, so you have to be a little careful. You want it, There is going to have to be some risk involved um, to avoid that type 2. Now, type 2, the chance of that happening is beta. All right, uh, famous type 2 errors would be cases with doping among sports, um, uh, different athletes where they were suspected of using drugs but allowed to continue playing. Uh, Roger Clemens and probably one of the most famous recent ones would be Lance Armstrong and they actually did use drugs. Um, here's two just sort of silly examples of that type 1 error. So again, we would say the null hypothesis is that you're not pregnant. You reject the null hypothesis incorrectly right here, and you tell somebody they are when they're not. On the other hand, if you're too careful, you never ever reject the null hypothesis, then you're going to tell someone who is pregnant they're not pregnant. That's that type 2 error. So type 1 error, we have it right here. You can see why it happens. Type 2 error is explained right here and why it happens. Now, the thing I'd like to talk about more is type 2, because that's a little more complicated. Type 1, you know, we choose our alpha, we decide ourselves what the probability is, what risk we want to take. Um, beta is a little bit different and a little more complicated. So what we always want to do with a type 2 is we want to have the most power possible. Power is the chance of not having that error, all right? So the probability of a type 2 error is beta, as we talked about. Here is that Greek letter. So the power is going to be 1 minus beta. So if there's a 5% chance of making a type 2 error, there's a, you have 95.95 .95 is your power. And you want your power to be as close to 100% as possible. That would be being more powerful. So we always need more power. That way we're less likely to make that. Now what a type 2 is, I want to explain it, um, where that beta comes from. It's a little complicated. But basically, um, what we're saying with a type 2 error is that we we retain the null hypothesis when it's not true. That means that something else is true. So this is my something else. See this bottom normal curve? What we're saying is that we had assumed that everything behaved this way up here. Okay, so if we were looking at the ingots example and um, how many errors or how many cracks those ingots get in the old machine way, this would be how it performs. That's the normal curve. Now a new mechanism comes along and it really is better. And so it's on a different normal curve. It has more often its mean is higher. Okay, it has a higher success rate. So we are in truth here, but we don't know it. We don't know it. We think it's the old way that is working. 
So to look at what error we have. So the way we do that is we take that alpha level, which is right here, and we look at that critical value for the cutoff, and we draw right down to across our new normal curve. And right here where there's an overlap, this means that if the p-value it fell anywhere in this part of this curve, or right over here, if that value did, um, then you would make a type 2 error. So the area of this, that is the probability of a type 2 area, because if anything falls over here, we are going to incorrectly retain the null. Whereas once we're in this area, you can see we're past that critical region, and we will reject the null, and we will say, yes, this is the normal curve that we're actually acting on right now. Understanding how to derive beta from here can be a little complicated, so I don't want you to worry too much about it. We will go into it a little bit. But what I do want to say that is awesome about beta is unlike alpha, which we just kind of decide and then it's set there, with beta there are ways that um, you can shrink beta and that increase the power. And that is if you have a larger sample size, okay? So the larger your sample size, the smaller beta will be. Also, if there's a bigger mean between um, your null hypothesis and the observed value, so that will make it more extreme. So if the mean is larger, so if we look at these two again, this is, we can say, our distribution for our null hypothesis. That would be the old machine that we were using. This is the distribution for the new machine that we know, in truth, secretly is better. If there was a bigger difference between these means, this right here, the second normal curve would shift over and beta would shrink. All right, so if you can find that bigger difference between the mean. The other way that you can reduce beta is by choosing a higher alpha. So if you choose a higher alpha, this line will move over because that critical value will become larger and that beta area will shrink. Just to go back to how the larger sample size will decrease that chance of making error and increase the power, when you have a larger sample size, your uh, standard deviation or your standard error will actually shrink. And when that happens, um, this normal curve will become narrower. So this true normal curve will shrink this way, will shrink over to here, become a narrow curve, and so you can see that beta would become smaller. So that probability of making that type of error would also shrink. Some of you might be interested in how in the world we actually find beta. We know like with alpha, we just choose. Do we want it to be 0 0.01, 0 0.05, uh, 0 0.10? With beta, there is an actual way to find it. Um, so if you're curious, just to let you know, how you do it is, again, when we're looking at beta, what we're doing is I'm assuming, if it's a type 2 error, that this is my true normal curve, but I just haven't proven it yet. Okay, so I'm going to be acting on this normal curve right here. So what I want to do is I want to find the probability of getting a Randall sample, of getting a sample that has a p-value greater than alpha. I know right here that this is my cutoff, okay? So if my p-value is smaller than alpha, I'm in this range, I'm fine, I'm going to reject the HO. But if the p-value is bigger, that is over here, I'm going, I'm going to uh, be retaining the HO, which is problematic. So what I need to do is I figure out my alpha value, figure out that critical value, and then I take that critical value and I set up, I figure out this normal curve, I figure out the mean and the standard deviation, and I just solve for this probability because I know if it falls in here, that's where my type 1 error is. So I just calculate the probability of getting a value that is greater than, I mean, sorry, smaller than alpha. So just a question about power. If I gave you two examples, I'm testing a pair of running shoes to see if they increase your speed. Now say I test a new pair, and it says it increases the speed by 5% from the old types of shoes. Now I want to do a test on a different pair. Now this one says that it increases your speed by 50%. My question to you, which one of these two is going to have more power? That means a smaller chance of a type 2 error when there's a 5% difference or a 50% difference. The answer is going to be right here with that 50% difference, okay? Because when you have more extreme values between your null hypothesis and your new data, your power is higher because that normal curve that we were looking at here of the new data is going to be shifted over even further. So there's not going to be much area on that side. And that is all on today's concepts. Hope those are clear for you.